Daniel 7. If you turn back in your Bibles there, I'm going to reference quite a number of verses because it's good for us to see it from the Word of God and um, read it there and see then what it means. I hope to give a, a bit of a clear picture of that tonight. But start to think about this chapter and what Adam just read for us. Think of the news. And the major uncertainties that we see around us in the world, the wars, the disasters, unclear power structures and and influences on governments. And you wonder, what's going on? Sometimes it can make us hopeless or maybe a bit fatalistic or despairing even, if we're not careful. Where do we find hope in all of that? So we come now to the second half of Daniel and basically whenever I told people I was going to do this. She said, wow, you're preaching it entirely. Also that second half, and maybe in your own Bible reading, you come to it and you think, well, I'm not sure what to do with these chapters. There are signs of insecurity, or maybe even a bit of fear. Like, rather leave it alone, those bits. You just don't know what to do with it. But it will be such a pity. I've prayed that tonight's message will give us all a better grasp of what's going on. And will give us encouragement to continue reading, even perhaps such daunting chapters at first because here is so much to learn and there's so much encouragement to be found here and Daniel 7 is really the the high point in the book of Daniel it's it's the hinge between the stories in the first half and all these dreams and visions in the second half why do I say that well this is the final chapter you can't see that in English but the final chapter that in the original text is written in Aramaic Chapters two to six stand uh, two to seven. I mean, stand apart within the book. The whole Old Testament is in Hebrew, but there are little bits that are in Aramaic, and that in itself shows that it has a strong link with what's gone before. And there are these parallel stories, as it were. This chapter, the vision in chapter seven, parallels the dream of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter two. So we've got a bit of help from that chapter, which is pretty clear to help us understand this chapter better. But on the other hand, clearly, as we just read it, this is no longer a normal story about a man called Daniel who lived in this world. No, we get into dreams and visions and beasts and all sorts of things going on. Clearly, the the style, the language, the genre of the chapter has changed. And, And this ties it to that second half of the book. All these dreams and visions with a but a grand scope and, and lots of symbolism for telling the future, what's going to happen. And these are called sometimes the apocalyptic writings. And in a recent evening message, we thought more about how to read that kind of uh, Bible passage well. Um, the message of that is online if you want to listen to that again. But we'll see how that works out in practice. That we see it is full of picture language. So compare it with a, with a comic book almost. And you, you glance at the picture and we let sink in the emotions that it that evokes in us. And we focus on, on what the picture as a whole is trying to tell us. Without trying to go and in, drill into the little detail in the corner of the picture as it were. So we're going to see how that works out with this vision. And so with the reading puzzled you a bit and all the things we came across don't worry I think we'll be able just uh, to unpack as much as we need to know to grasp that main lesson and and be encouraged by it and we get a hint of that even in verse 1 just see it there Daniel wrote down the substance of his dream he didn't write the whole thing down and you know how hard it can be right to to grasp a picture in words a picture is more worth than a thousand words we sometimes say But he has written down just as much as we need to know. And we'll see then that the main message that we've seen so far in the book of Daniel continues. God's kingdom lasts forever. And proud kings and rulers that stand up against him will be judged by God. He is in control. He is on the throne. That main message continues even in the second half of the book. And they... Therefore, the, for the initial readers of the book of Daniel, as well as for Christians throughout the ages and for us, these visions are here not to puzzle us or make us sort of scared of a bit of the Bible. No, they are here to encourage us and to challenge us to keep living for God in a world that is so often full of turmoil. Now, let's go over the vision then in verse 1 to 14. And the second half of the chapter, 15 to 28, is the, the 
the explanation that Daniel receives, and we just put that parallel. So we go through the vision, and we take up the explanatory bits as we go along. And I think it's a bit like an action movie, where you sometimes switch from scene to scene in quick succession. In this chapter 2, we get a vision of beasts, and then we suddenly get into the throne room in heaven, and see the throne, and then we go back to the beasts, and back to that sun in the throne room. And so it's a bit like an action movie, as it were. Quickly changing scenes. Now the first thing we must see then, as the vision starts, as the dream starts, is, is the bad news. The bad news that there are beastly powers, and they are raging. And maybe, maybe you know, the, sometimes you have nightmares, and it becomes so real and so vivid, these images, and you wake up and you're all sweaty and bodily, you've responded to it. And you think, what's going on? That's a bit like what Daniel had. Twice in the chapter we see how he was so gripped and he was all shaken by the vision. What did he see? Well, verse 2. Four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Later in the chapter, verse 17, the explanation given, it tells us that these beasts are four kingdoms that will rise up from the earth. And that already shows us beasts and sea, they are pictures, they are symbols of strong powers in this world, of kingdoms in this world. Kings and kingdoms, it's a, it used interchangeably in the chapter. Sometimes it's called kings, sometimes kingdoms. But they come up out of the sea, which in the Bible is usually a picture of, of chaos and of danger. Let's look at these four beasts then. In verse 4, we see the first beast. It's like a lion, but with wings. And we see that this, in the sort of looking at the book as a whole, we know that this is about the Babylonian Empire. And especially perhaps King Nebuchadnezzar as that powerful king. Just like the head of the statue in chapter 2, the golden the head of the statue, that is you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Then verse 5, the second beast, it's like a bear. And one side is stronger, it's leaning over, so there's, a, there's basically two parts to it, you could say. Well, this is about that second empire, the second bit of the statue, it's the Medo-Persian Empire. We saw it last week in the lion's den. The king was now Darius the Mede. The Babylonians had been pushed away from power, and the Medes and the Persians, an empire consisting of two parts, was ruling the world at the time. And that one side that was stronger matches with the Persians who were much stronger than the Medes and ended up being the dominant force. It devoured many nations. Up to that time, no greater empire had ever been seen than that Medo-Persian empire. But after that, a third beast comes, verse 6. A third beast, like a leopard, again with four wings and, and with four heads. It is very quick, it says. This matches the third kingdom, the third of the statue, the third that we see in later visions as well. Chapters 8 and 11 will say much more about these second and third kingdoms. But this quickness, it shows us this is about the Greek Empire. It had a very rapid conquest of the world in those days under Alexander the Great. But when he died after a, at a very young age, four generals rose up and they split up that empire. Four heads who sort of together tried to rule that quickly conquering empire and then verse 7 a fourth kingdom and Daniel says it is stronger it is more terrifying it's not not even like an animal we know he doesn't compare it to a, a familiar animal anymore it has got iron teeth that's linking it to the iron feet of the statue in chapter 2 that again also the fourth kingdom and it's God it crushed and it devoured its victims, says verse 7. And it trampled underfoot what was left. And later in the chapter, perhaps you notice that, Daniel is especially interested in this fourth kingdom. He asks the angel about it, particularly in verse 19, and, and wants to know more about that fourth beast and what's going on there. And in verse 23, the angel explains it. Verse 23, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. And will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. 
So initially you think, okay, what came after the Roman Empire? From our point of view, uh, from the, after the Greeks, it was the Roman Empire. From our point of view, and it seems to be fulfilled in the Roman Empire, which was stronger and greater than all that had gone before. And during that empire, the Son of God came into the world. If you think again of the dream of the statue, during that fourth kingdom, as it were, the stone came rolling down from the mountain and it crushed the whole statue. But the picture seems to be more generic and less clearly bound to just the Roman Empire. I don't think we can limit it to just the Roman Empire, especially when, when this vision continues and it focuses on ten horns and later an eleventh horn rising up. <coughs> The ten horns and the little horn are explained by the angel in verse 24. Ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Notice that, who, they will come from this kingdom. So it seems that those ten horns aren't simply, well, we, we need to look in the list of Roman emperors and, and see which of the ten emperors might be, might be this. I don't think it works that way. The horn in the Bible is a symbol for, for a power. And ten is, is it often used for a totality. So ten horns coming from this fourth beast suggests that, that a whole lot of powerful empires build on or succeed the foundation laid by that fourth beast, as it were. And I think that, that is what we see in the world. If you think about all the Roman, um, the Roman Empire, how it broke up, and how all the modern day empires are basically still building on the foundations laid by what Rome has done, that seems to match the picture. Because the vision, it can't be limited to just history. It's going in all into the future. And especially now with that 11th horn, it, it will get worse. Because that little horn comes. Verse 24 again. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And see what Daniel already said in verse 21. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. But what a terrible picture this is, right? A powerful king who is proudly opposing God with many boastful words, who is also persecuting God's people. He is waging war and he's, he's oppressing them and he's even, even given control over them for a time, times and half a time until God intervenes. Well, in these verses then we see all those details and you think, what, what do you do with that? And you can be tempted to, to go into the history books and see, okay, which detail matches best? And there, oh, that, that, that guy, didn't, didn't Napoleon want to try to change the times and the seasons? Or... Didn't that guy particularly oppress the people? I think if we, if we go that way, we miss the point that the vision is making. And we must remember that this is God's word for his church. Not just for the church in one decade, somewhere in history, but for us today too. So what's going on? What's this all about? These beasts, we see, they point to world empires in proud opposition to God and God's people, the church. Starts quite clear with historical empires visible in Daniel's day and into the, in the near future for him. Chapters 4 and 5 gave us clear examples of those proud kings rising up and being judged by God. But as the vision progresses further on into the future, the identification becomes less clear and more general. And therefore I think that it's best to understand this as that the vision actually covers the time right up to the end of of time till Jesus returns. That's why I've titled the sermon World History in a Nutshell. This vision, it seems to just go on and end with the kingdom of God covering the whole world, defeating all the worldly empires that stand up against them. Because you see that in verse 11 and verse 26. They, this, it covers their time right till the final judgment when that final great enemy is judged by God. And destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The verse 11 and 26. And so, isn't that what we see today? Today we still see many world empires and kings and leaders in proud opposition to God. Some do so blatantly. With severe persecution of God's people. And any people really. 
Just remember again, if you were at the theatre event on Friday, we saw a glimpse of what that's like. Kings and dictators raging against God and, and trampling countless people, sometimes in their own countries. And these pa powers in the world can therefore, I think, quite rightly be pictured as beasts. Devouring, trampling. What a rebellion against God we see in the world still today. How much suffering due to wars and, and oppression of people. You know, think of Afghanistan, North Korea, China, the Middle East, so many parts of the world. It could go on and on. You can hear it in the news. For organizations like Open Doors or, or Release International. Let's keep praying for our brothers and sisters around the world in those countries. Some some kings therefore oppose God blatantly and rage like beasts. But I think it's also important to see that others oppose God and they rage, as it were, more subtly. They just present a different worldview to deceive people, pull them away from God and keep them bound to their own power. I think with our prosperity and, and general safety in this land, we are more living in, a, in this kind of situation. But don't be caught off guard here. God is marginalized. God is ridiculed. God is blasphemed. So in a sense, there's still that proud opposition against God. And we, his people, are more and more seen to be living in the past than ignorant or even intolerant. So the first lesson is that Daniel 7 prepares us to live in a sinful, broken world. This is to be expected. This sort of beastly raging of world powers. And the wars and the turmoil, the suffering, the injustice, the crime. Without God's grace coming in to fix and heal things, it is almost as if sin turns us humans into beasts, isn't it? But remember that behind all that physical suffering and evil is a spiritual reality, a spiritual war. And Daniel 7 therefore also warns us against slumbering and, and coasting on through life as if there's no war going on. Outwardly, outwardly we might have things very good here in the West, 2024. But the spiritual war is raging here, just as it does elsewhere. And therefore we shouldn't be surprised that at some point it comes to the surface in our lives too. So let's take up our Christian armour, as we've heard a while ago from Ephesians 6. Let's remember that the Bible calls us to be soldiers in the army of King Jesus. The songs after the sermon will pick up on this theme. But as history continues though, the, the movement in this vision from Daniel, as well as visions in the book of Revelation, the movement of that all, it seems clear. Yes, God's kingdom continues to grow, and eventually it will cover the whole world. But also opposition and hatred will grow, and the beasts get more and more terrifying. With each beast, the raging becomes fiercer. All of that will culminate in that little horn, as it were, that seems to be a picture of the final enemy, the Antichrist, or what Paul calls the man of lawlessness in, in 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll deal more with this in, in later chapters where we find more little horns. Because there's not just one in chapter 7, also one in chapter 8, for example. And now you might be thinking, well, what with all the bad news? No wonder then that Daniel was deeply moved. See verse 15 and verse 8, 28. Verse 28, I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts. My face turned pale. But this chapter is not given that we raise our hands in despair. And that we give up or that we hide away in fear. No, there is also very good news. And let's see that in the three remaining points which are all much shorter than uh, this one. But there is good news. And the first part of that is another of the main characters in this chapter. So far we've, seen, we've looked at the beasts and we're now going to see three other main characters in this chapter. And the first one is God himself. And God rules over all. You can see it there. We get a scene change. Rightly when things seem at their worst in Daniel's vision. The scene suddenly changes. And Daniel sees reality and world history from a different perspective. From the heavenly throne room. Look at how verse 8 continues into verse 9. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Sudden change. As I looked, thrones were set in place. 
and the Ancient of Days took his seat. And here our great God is described. The Ancient of Days is described. Remember our theme song. This God is eternal. He always was. He always will be. He was there before those beasts came on the scene. And indeed before he even created the world. And he will survive them all. And in that description, the white clothes are pictures of God's purity. And his white hair and his great age are pictures of, of his biblical, uh, the biblical pictures of his wisdom. So we see here, pictured like an old man seated on a throne, it is a sign of a wise, eternal, holy God. And God's throne is described as uh, like a, a chariot of, of a, a warrior in those ancient days in the time of Daniel. It's similar to what Ezekiel saw in his first vision. A, a flaming chariot ready where God is, is enthroned. And, and from it comes a river of fire. And fire is often associated with, with God's revelation of himself. Think of the burning bush or Mount Sinai. Uh, God brings fire as pictures again of God himself coming into the world. But we see God sitting on a throne sitting down to rule and I think that's so encouraging in itself because it shows that God isn't frantically running around fixing things that all the beasts are doing wrong patching things up where they have trampled no see again those descriptions in verse 4 to 6 the beasts are passive in what happens to them verse 4 to 6 the lion's wings were torn off and a heart was given the bear was told to eat. The leopard was given authority to rule. All of it shows that God is acting and in control. He doesn't react to them doing things. No, God acts and gives and ordains. And yet when he says it's over, it is over. And that's where we come in verse 11. Because while that boastful talk of that little horn continues, the moment comes... When, verse 11, the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Verse 26 adds to that. But when the court will sit, uh, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. So one day, even the strongest of God's enemies will be utterly defeated. No one will be left to speak against the Most High God. And no longer will they be able to oppress the holy people of God. Verse 25. And so for us today, when we are confronted by these raging beasts in the world, where do we turn? Do we look to this ancient of days? We may be just small people in a very big world, but our supreme commander is available for us. And we can call on him and we can pray to him. And he loves us to talk to him in prayer. Because he loves us. And the good news continues because there is also a son of man receiving the kingdom. How will this judging and this rule of God happen? Well, see verses 13 and 14. Again, a scene change. We've sort of in the meantime briefly come back to the beast. Now back into heaven. Verse 13 and 14. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So there's this, this figure coming into the heavenly throne room. A, a human being, a, a son of man. But clearly he's more than that. Because he comes with the clouds of heaven. And in the Old Testament that is a picture uh, that is uh, about God himself. God comes with the clouds of heaven. For example, Isaiah 19 verse 1. And I think... In and of itself, this description, son of man, is so beautiful. Because what a contrast with all the beasts. Well, you've got all these beasts raging, but here comes the son of man, a human figure. And he is allowed to approach this ancient of days. He's coming into the presence of this holy, wise God. And so there can, can't be anything but a perfect human being. See then how verse 14 continues. He was given authority. Glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now again, look, thinking about the whole book of Daniel. 
an everlasting dominion that will not be destroyed. That was said of God himself. Chapters 2 and 4 and 6. And in verse 14 it also says that uh, the Son of Man now has that dominion. And what's more, he receives worship from all peoples and nations. Something that only God is worthy of. Who is this Son of Man then? Oh, it's Jesus, yes. Jesus Christ himself, who is God and man. And of course, we, we reading this long after Daniel wrote it down, we have the New Testament. And, and we know that Jesus used that title, Son of Man, most of all titles for himself. He didn't say it just to point to his real humanity. No, but also to pick up this chapter, Daniel 7. He is that Son of Man. And when Jesus' life came to the climax at the very end, in those last hours before the cross, he stood there before the Jewish rulers, right? The high priest and so on. And in the book of Matthew, we then read this. Matthew 26, verse 63. The high priest said to Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So if anyone ever says to you, Jesus never claimed to be God, this is one of the many passages that you can go to. He did claim to be God and the high priest realised it because the next verse, I've not got it on here. But they didn't believe him and they accused him of blasphemy and they condemned him to death on the cross. But he says basically, shortly, Jesus says, shortly I will be that son of man from the book of Daniel, entering the presence of the ancient of days on the clouds of heaven, ready to receive my everlasting kingdom. Wow. So Jesus is that son of man. He's truly God. He's truly man. He's perfectly sinless. And with his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, he took up that place in the heavenly throne room. And there he now sits. And he rules over the universe with all authority and glory and sovereign power. And isn't that what he also said to us at the end of Matthew's Gospel and the Great Commission? All authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore you go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And we live in that time to the very end of the age. The time of, of both now and not yet. The time where the decisive battle has been won on the cross and the empty tomb. But, but the war is not yet over. God's kingdom has truly come but not yet fully. And there's work to do then. Work, the Great Commission. And so we long for that day when all God's people will be reached and, and gathered in and made disciples and baptized and taught. The day when all God's enemies will finally be defeated. The day God's court will sit and the books will be opened. And dreadful indeed will be that day for all those who are not in the book of life. Who are living in sin and in opposition to God. Those who have sided with the beasts. Like the little horn in verse 11, they will be thrown into the blazing fire, says the word of God. But glorious will be that time for you and me, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. See verse 22. Those beasts only rage until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. That brings us to a final point, fourthly. Because do you see it there? We could have stopped here with the good news. We belong to this Son of Man. What, what more could we wish, in a sense? That there is an answer for all those raging beasts. The Son of Man is stronger. His kingdom will rule and win. Such good news already, but there is more. Do you see how verse 22 ends? And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. We, God's people, will possess that everlasting kingdom. We are so closely identified with that glorious Son of Man 
Like the chapter says both. He will be given the kingdom. And they, we, will receive it too. See verse 18. The holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So, we will reign together with Jesus, our Saviour King. Verse 27. Then the sovereignty, power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey Him. Isn't that amazing? God's kingdom lasts forever. And we will rule it together with our Saviour Jesus, who loved us so much that He gave His own life. He was killed and trampled by the beasts. But He did it for us who believe in Jesus, so that we can be called those holy people of the Most High. Paul wrote later to Timothy 2, These verses. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Mm-hmm. Now the problem is, of course, that we are not yet there. At the end of world history, we are living in this broken world. Amidst those beast-like kingdoms that are still raging against God and against God's people. With lots of sin, even in our own hearts, to struggle with and fight against. And thousands of our brothers and sisters around the world are still persecuted for their faith. Often it seems as if the beasts are winning and are defeating them. Uh, Many Christians face terrible persecution and and find themselves in the hands of those wicked rulers. So how do we respond then? When we hear of such suffering in, in so many countries, or when we are worried about the direction of this world and, and the society we are living in, or when we see efforts of, of people in power to make like a world government and have their influence and their control wherever they can get it. What do we do? Or closer to home when you personally face bullying or mockery because you want to belong to that son of man. When you want to stand up against the raging beast and you face the, the opposition for it. What do we do? Where do we look? Do you know the hope? Daniel 7 teaches us That the things around the world and in our lives might very well get a lot worse. But the good news is far better than we could ever have come up with. Or hoped for. Because the end is certain. God wins and we will receive the everlasting kingdom. And now of course, while that good news is the best possible comfort, it doesn't remove the seriousness and the pain of today's suffering and oppression. Our persecuted brothers and sisters really suffer. Physically, mentally, spiritually. And so may you and I. Our certain hope for the future doesn't mean we are immune to pain or sorrow. It doesn't promise a a healthy, wealthy life in the here and now. Indeed, Jesus and the apostles predicted that suffering and persecution are part and parcel of the Christian life. But our certain hope for the future does mean that we have every reason to keep going. Every reason to place our trust firmly on the words of this ancient of days. The God who revealed this vision to Daniel. Because the end is secure. And in the meantime, he will give us the strength and the help from the Holy Spirit as we seek to serve him and to follow him faithfully. So let's go into this new week with that confidence, shall we?